Okay, so um, good news is both the, my colleagues have already said a lot of what I'm going to say, which, me, which means that I can go a bit faster. So I'm going to do my best so that we can actually at least finish the, this talk and the next one. So um, I'm going to talk about cervical cancer secondary prevention, which is basically cervical screening and how to organize it a little bit because I think I'll have to uh, rush a bit. So, well, you've already seen this map, uh, and we know that there are more than 500,000 cases. There were more than 500,000 cases in 2012. The majority of them are in, um, wait, I can never find this one. Ah. Uh, as um, Vitaly was saying, the majority of them are in the in Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia, uh, and uh, Russia, of course. Um, so, but if if we focus a bit of, on Russia, we could see what are the top uh, the five top cancers in number of cases in Russia, as estimated by Global Globocam in 2012. And I wanted to highlight the case of women, where we have that the first cancer or, or the cancer most frequent was uh, breast cancer, followed by colorectal cancer, and only in fifth place was cervical cancer. It's still with uh, 15,000. Uh, cases, which is a large number for a disease that is totally preventable. So um, I'm going to go faster on this because I think it's, all, it's also only to, to estrange the concept that we know that persistent infection with uh, high risk uh, human papillomavirus types is the main risk factor and, and a necessary cause for cervical cancer. And this was demonstrated by Balboomers uh, and his group in, in 1999 when they actually tested uh, an, a series of cervical tumors that were coming from all over the world and they found HPV in almost 100% of of them. Um, and furthermore, we know that 70% of those cervical cancers that occur in the world are caused by types HPV 16 and 18, that most HPV infections will not progress into cervical disease, and that and in any case, cervical cancer will not develop without the presence of HPV. We also know that HPV infection is age dependent. We could see here uh, the age uh, at adjusted uh, prevalence curve for HPV in different regions of the world, for Africa, for no Northern America, Central and South America, Europe and Asia. And, uh, and, and I think that the, the, the common point here is that at ages below 25 is where you see the highest prevalence of HPV all over the world. With some particular features, because of, uh, it seems that there is, gonna, there, is, there is a second peak at around 50 or 55 or from 50 onwards in most of the regions with the exception of Asia. So we know that HPV uh, is age dependent, and that means that high prevalence is going to be among young women, and that most HPV inf infections will clear spontaneously, especially those in young women. And so most women with HPV infection will not have cervical disease and will not require treatment. And this graph, you've seen it like three times now, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, we have now tools that could prevent uh, cervical cancer, and those are based in the fact that we were able to, es to, es to clearly establish the association between HPV and cervical cancer. So cervical cancer is a preventable disease. We have two main means of preventing it, by vaccination and by screening. Vaccination have already been, uh, been uh, done by Vitaly. And uh, the only thing I wanted to highlight here is, no matter how much has been done in HPV vaccination, there are two points that one should consider. One is that, uh, as Vitaly shown in one of his slides, the populations that are the ones that are more at risk of developing cervical cancer, which are unfortunately Unfortunately, those in Africa, for instance, are uh, the populations that are not being offered vaccination because it's not available in their countries. And even in those cases, in those places where we do have vaccination, it will take several decades to see an impact on ca cervical cancer rates only due to vaccination. So cervical screening should continue. And we know that for decades we have had cytology-based screening everywhere, mostly in Europe and in Latin America there's been cytology available. And cytology has actually been effective in decreasing cervical cancer rates. Whenever it's been used uh, in an opportunistic way, as, uh, achieving high coverage. 
and then when it has been applied with sustainable organized screening programs that have a lot of uh, quality assurance uh, aspects. And again, the, 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 the main example of the UK of, of, of the introduction of the national call recall system, which means that the, organiza the, the, the clear organization of the system in 1989, where you could see that then afterwards, the, the, the rates of cervical, the incidence rates of cervical cancer started decreasing sharply while the coverage started increasing. And again, uh, a projection that was done in year 2004 estimated that had not that happened, so hadn't had the national uh, call recall system been introduced at that point, uh, uh, and had had this effect of the decreasing in cervical cancer rates, this would have been the actual curve of cervical cancer in the UK. So basically, that if we've been an epidemic of cervical cancer, if they have not changed the system into an organized one. And it's, it's, it's good to show that cytology, um, it's, a, it's unfortunately a subjective test. And, all, and because of being subjective, it, the, the, the accuracy of the test varies substantially among labs. And this only means that we need a very, very uh, a strong quality assurance program, internal and external within a lab, to actually achieve high sensitivity and maintain it over time. So, and, and this comes from a meta-analysis that was done by Jakusik, and you could see that the combined estimate for the sensitivity of cytology to detect CIN2 was only about 50%. So then, even in, in low and middle income countries, which is one of, of the areas of the world that I, I work most, uh, we, we have had an, a, a number of additional program, problems. And one of them has to actually not being able to define correctly what coverage is. So in our countries, it has been said that coverage was the number of pubs that a, a hospital, a region, an area could do per year. And that has led only, so, so if you put a quota to people to actually do a number of pubs per year, that only will lead to have a lot of uh, young women being screened, women less than 20 years of age, a number of women screened twice or three times a year unnecessarily, and leaving out at those who really need to be screened and have never been screened and are probably at higher risk than anybody. So if we can summarize cytology, I think the main advantage of cytology is that it's very specific, that uh, it has shown when it's properly applied to be effective in reducing cervical cancer rates, but it has a limited sensitivity, li low reproducibility, and that system that is attached to having a program based in cytology is too complex for at least for low and middle income countries. Now, so it was promoted to do to look for alternatives to cytology, and one of them was visual inspection with acetic acid, which was already mentioned by Parta. And visual inspection is that it just consists on the naked eye inspection of the cervix after the application of acetic acid, in which case is called VIA, or after uh, application of Lugols, in which case is called VILI. It's a low cost test and it's avail the results are available immediately, which is the main advantage of the test because it can be used in, in C and treat schemes. Of course, it has a lot of disadvantages as well. It has been evaluated all over the world and the studies conducted in India and Africa have reported better results substantially better results than those in Latin America. And, uh, but however, better results have been reported always for Billy. Nevertheless, uh, the main problem of visual inspection is the low reproducibility, the subjectivity of the test. It will need really supervision and monitoring, and we're still working on how to do that. And, um, and if we use it in C and treat schemes, of course we're going to have over-treatment, and of course we're going to have under-treatment. So it's quite difficult to handle, but we still think that it should be applied in places where there is not, no other alternative to do, and where uh, the incidence of cervical cancer is extremely high. Now we move into HPV testing, so this causal, causal uh, establishment of HPV and cervical cancer uh, led to the development of two things, the vaccines and the HPV 
uh, screening tests. Uh, so we know that all the most of the tests are more sensitive than cytology and, and visual inspection to detect CIN2, that HPV testing is objective and requires a less complex quality assurance system than cytology. It can be automated and centralized if you want to use it in large cities, in large urban areas. And we also can use self-sampling if we somehow, if that somehow will help us to increase coverage or to manage better our system. In the pool analysis of the European and North American studies that I mentioned before when I talk about cytology, and this slide has also been shown before, we could see that, um, just look over here, this line, cytology positivity and CIN2+, plus actually means sensitivity. So sensitivity to detect CIN2+, plus, you could see that it's about, the, the, the final estimate is about 50%. Well, if, when you compare it to HPV testing, mainly done by Hybrid Capture 2, the estimate, the final estimate is, about, is above 95%. And this has been repeated all over the world, in general. Another, another fact of HPV testing is that uh, while pulling all the randomized trials that were conducted in Europe, in 2008, Dillner uh, published this paper by which we could see that uh, once a woman uh, tests negative for, a, for HPV, she can she continue having very low risk of developing cervical disease within a frame time. At this point, it was seven years, but we believe we, we have now evidence that it could be up to 10 years. And this actually helps a lot because we can safely extend the uh, screening interval. And that we, we should always think about screening and cost effectiveness, screening and a public health intervention. So um, we know that many infections will clear, that not all HPV-positive women will require further investigation or treatment. And because of the age-dependent, we know that HPV screening should not start before 30 years of age. But the main problem is the low specificity of HPV testing, and it has delayed his, its introduction in cervical screening. We know that 10 to 15% HPV-positive will uh, we will find 10 to 15 percent HPV positive compared to 0.5, 1.5, or maybe 4 percent of normal PAPs in a population, in a target population. So we need to be prepared for that. And the problem is that the increased number of referrals may be not workable by any health system. So the evidence for using HPV testing is high, but we still have that problem of the specificity. And, uh, and uh, despite that, a number of tests have been uh, developed, and I could tell you there are more than 100 tests all over the world. And here I've just shown the ones that are either FDA approved or they have uh, they are CE approved and have been more validated by different schemes that are nowadays available. And uh, and 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 these are one of of the more used uh, or more used in studies, but there are many many others. Uh, tests available. And the issue of selecting the test, because as Parta said, part of a screening program is to be able to select the right test for your population, for your context, for your, uh, for your, uh, for your system itself. So we, we have here one of the predictors study. This is predictors two. They, they publish actually four studies, different studies. And we could see here a number of tests, including Capture 2, which is now sort of the comparative uh, test for all new tests. And uh, we see Optima Cobas, BDE, Abbott, all of these tests showing a sensitivity of over 95%. While we see cytology, either repeated or along, where we have um, a, about 85% sensitivity, but which has a, 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 a higher specificity than the others. So whether this test can eventually, or any other new test can eventually be used as a single primary screening test, it's still not clear. There, there, there's, there is a lot of work in terms of finding a, a better test that is enough specific and finding tests that can be point of care, especially for populations where difficult access to health. And it's, but it is more likely that a second test will be needed to triage HPV positive women. And this second test is more likely to be cytology in developed areas where, where there are good cytology labs where you can afford high quality and maintain it. And, uh, and that there will need to be a different test for other areas. 
So in summary, HPV testing is, uh, is objective, reproducible, accurate, and uh, it has the problem of limited specificity, which in turn will, will lead us to a problem in the follow-up of positive, positive. It requires some technical, specific, some technical issues. It could actually, uh, if not, uh, um, if information is not given in the right way to the population and to women, can generate social stigma. And this is still high cost, especially for low and middle income countries. Uh, I think it's very bad quality, this, but uh, I wanted to say here where HPV DNA testing uh, for cervical cancer screening is being used all over the world, although the colors don't help me. But we have national programs, for instance, in Argentina, Italy, Mexico, Netherlands, the United States. And so the question of which screening approach should be used within an HPV screening setting still needs to be answered. And more importantly, we don't have an answer for difficult settings yet. I could show you here one algorithm, the one that is being used in Argentina for screening in a national program. That This is the way that they introduced the program. I, I apologize for the for the graph being in Spanish. But it's just to say that uh, they do the HPV test. If women are HPV positive, they do cytology. If cytology is abnormal, they send them to colposcopy. If cytology is negative, they repeat HPV uh, and cytology, like co-testing at 12 months. And again, they repeat the battery. And for those negative, they call them uh, for co-testing at three years. Nowadays, they're changing this algorithm because they've been successful in introducing it in, in, in a region in Argentina. And I also want to highlight that there are guidelines for how to address cervical screening and treatment of precancerous lesions, particularly in low middle income countries. And we know that uh, it depends on what you have in, in your setting. Uh, if you have the possibility of do cytology followed by colposcopy, go ahead. If you have the possibility of introducing HPV test, go ahead. Now, if you do HPV testing, you need as probably a triage test. If you are in a low research setting, you can use visual inspection or you can do HPV test alone. And if nothing of this is available, go for visual inspection and try to treat women. So uh, we still need to develop things. We still need to study things. We still need research in terms of triage techniques. We need to build evidence into screen and treat schemes using HPV testing and we need definitely to develop a platform for organized HPV-based cervical screening. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this study we are conducting in the full of Latin America, but I think due to time, I'm just gonna leave you with uh, a slide showing you um, the approach uh, to actually conduct a screening in, a, in the field in a multi-centric study in 11 countries and uh, all the issues that probably one has to take into control, which are quality assurance and all the challenges that one can face when we try to introduce only HPV testing and then adapt it into a, an organized screening program. Thank you. So I think, uh, I don't know if you have a question for Vitaly or for me. Oh, one for each because otherwise. A great presentation. Uh, just a short question. Can you suggest? We have um, many regions established cytology service, but the quality assurance is not in place for cytology. Same time, we don't have uh, experience of HPV um, testing. Uh, what, what is the solution in, in Russia? Should we start implementing quality assurance for cytology or should we also so invest time and resources into HPV testing? Well, uh, the, to reach high quality in cytology over a country as large as Russia uh, and to maintain it even more, it's going to be extremely difficult. So I would suggest that uh, step by step, you know, gradually try to move to HPV testing. You could do it like they started doing in, in, in the UK when they started uh, setting sentinel, uh, sentinel centers, where you can actually start by uh, setting up uh, HPV labs in specific areas, which can work as hubs, and then move cytology as a hub into that area. 
lab, so, so that both things are together. Because given the fact that you have so much cytology, uh, if you're going to work on quality of cytology, it's better to work on the quality of reduced labs that can act as triage of HPV eventually, when you get to that point. But I would definitely, uh, and that statement that my group and I have, is that the, the, the world now should really move into HPV testing. Because otherwise, whatever you're doing now, now is not cost effective.